Hey guys, welcome to another episode of MMA This Week. As always, I'm your host, Dan the Wolfman, and I will be breaking down War of the Worlds 232. I mean, Ultimate Fighting Challenge 232. I mean, Ultimate Fighting Championship 232. Of course, that is John Jones versus Alexander Gustafson, or Gustafson, depending on how you want to say it. Uh, Dos for the light heavyweight title which, uh, of course, Daniel Cormier let the UFC drop his title so they can make this fight. And featherweight title fight, Chris Cyborg, champion, taking on the 135-pound champion, Amanda Nuna. So that's really a true super fight. So very exciting stuff. Now, uh, a little bit about me, guys, if you're not familiar. I've been doing martial arts for 33 years and MMA for 22 years. Back when it was called No Holds Barred, I fought two UFC light heavyweight contenders in my day that both fight for the title. Jeremy Horn, of course, fought Chuck Liddell for the title. And uh, Yuki Kondo, who fought Tito Ortiz for the title. Besides that, I also commentated five live, the first five live Pancrase events from Tokyo, Japan on UFC Fight Pass. Check them out, guys, uh, starting with uh, Pancrase 270. Check them out, see if you like my commentary. Now, guys, this event moved from Las Vegas last minute to Inglewood, California. And why is that? Lo and behold, John Jones pops for a substance yet again in his system. Hmm. But the fight's still going on. Hmm. Usada, the fight's still going on. Hmm. NSX says, not here. KSX says, come and bring the money over to California. Um... Generally, I like what KSAC does at California State Athletic Commission, but we're talking big money here. Big money rules all. What was in John Jones' system, you say? Well, Tyrannoball. Oh, like the same thing that was in his system, what, 15 months ago, I believe? Hmm. Tyrannoball. Hmm. Still in his system. Still in his system from way back when, this lean guy. He's not an 800-pound guy. So it wouldn't be in his fat cells. This lean, exceptional athlete isn't that interesting. Tyrannoball has a 16-hour half-life, meaning it's out of your system. Most reports within five days. I mean, East German Olympians got away with this for over two decades without popping. I mean, all of them were on it. Literally, this was a state-sponsored program. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Now, I like John Jones in a way. I love watching him fight, and I'm glad the fight's still going on in, in, in a big sense. He's even given me big props at a press conference before, saying I know my stuff and I'm, I'm um, very credible. Um, but, you know, I rustle some feathers because, you know, I was doing media for a couple years, but the rest of the media is a joke. I'll actually say the truth. You know, uh, it's not real media uh, because they just want to get, you know, good seats, free seats, so they can hobnob and pretend they're famous. Um, speaking of fame, guys, I am a SAG uh, actor and stuntman. I said that. Look for me in the very last few seconds of the passage, if I didn't say that, at the last episode of the season. And look at the preview. I think it starts January 14th. It does look very cool on Fox. And uh, maybe even a certain uh, karate sequel wearing this very same shirt season two hopefully you'll be able to spot me for a few seconds uh spend some a youtube guy on a youtube show that'd be kind of cool so anyway this is the very same john jones that popped for a tyranno ball before um hmm seems like this is something you take only once or twice a day doing your research hmm seems to me that if you stack that with testosterone suspension that only stays in your system for like 24 hours that I know certain champions have used before uh, and even mentioned kind of mistakenly in an interview like they had knowledge of, of such a drug and they shouldn't have mentioned that um, boy it seems like if you microdose testosterone suspension daily and you took one or even twice a day the Tyrannoball seemed like an amazing stack for a professional fighter to take uh, also, amazingly, John Jones previously had popped for Clomid, which is very common, but also the extremely, extremely, extremely powerful aromatose inhibitor AI, Letrozole. I mean, where are these guys? What, what grocery store or gas station are these guys going to for the male enhancement pills that they obviously so need, even though cops have found them with 
huge amounts of, of uh, condoms in their car uh, during uh, hit and runs that they flee. Um, where are these guys finding not only the exact drugs that a professional fighter would want, but in the exact dosages that are perfect for them and when it killed them, like the extremely uh, strong letrozole, which, <laughs> you know, even a little bit of dose, if you were taking daily, your estrogen would crash and you would have fever symptoms and black shits and you'd be in the hospital within a matter of days. It just, it's, it's just amazing. The luck that some people have. I want to know what store they're going to where they can buy it for only a few dollars. Because, you know, these 19-inch guns could always improve. I, I want to know what gas station they're going to, that, the, the, to to find this stuff. It's amazing that it doesn't kill them. And it's the perfect amounts that they need. And it's the perfect thing that they need. So anyway, guys, it's I'll get into breaking down the actual fight. It's, it's moving to Inglewood, California. Now, maybe this time we will actually hear uh, Joe Rogan uh, calling them oblique kicks instead of the mythical elliptical kicks that he called in their first fight. And of course, until I called Joe out and who I used to roll with for two years uh, on a forum, and then he finally popped on the forum when it blew up and everyone was ragging on me, and then he said, yeah, Dan's completely right. You can throw this kick two different ways, neither of which is elliptical. It's like a piston, chasse boss G direct, and savat, or it's uh, with a sweeping motion, neither which is elliptical. So he said I'm very knowledgeable, very strong, very friendly. He said that a few times online, back in the days, of course, before certain things. Um... Anyway, we know that Alexander Gustafsson, uh, historically, is capable of grievous bodily harm. I mean, this is literally on record. He's capable of doing grievous bodily harm to people. Uh, but even if John Jones wins, we know he might flee the scene, historically speaking, of course. Um, so apparently, uh, John's felony fell off after he completed his probation. Since we see him rocking uh, an F FN 509 tactical, in the preview show, which would be a good choice to have on him while driving to the event in Inglewood, California, I might add. Of course, uh, except for the fact that California so righteously thinks they are above the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. Um, so, you know, you really shouldn't do so. Um, in the first fight, we obviously saw that Jones was better with his distance kicking game, oblique kicks and um, linear kicks and side kicks to the knee, a lot of side kicks to the knee, even from the black leg. Uh, or the thigh, even though they're hitting the knee. Either one, the Charlie horse the thigh, or hits the knee and hyperextends it a bit. No, it shouldn't be outlawed. They've been doing it in amateur fights for pro almost 100 years uh, in Savat without all these catastrophic uh, things you would hear about of champions falling off and stuff, both amateur and pro. Anyway, um, Gustafson, uh, Gustafson, Gustafson uh, boxed them up pretty good. Um, uh, he will probably always be the better boxer. He's a very good natural boxer. Um, he has good distance with his hands, good combinations. He'll be a little more confident going into this fight, I feel. Um, however, Jones goes through like obsessive compulsive things. So for a little while, at least a few months, I think he was really rocking at a Gracie Baja in the gi, which means he's practiced some on his back, which could be a very good thing for this fight. Um, he got his blue belt from Gracie Baja, I believe, uh, and, um, you know, we saw him out grappled Ben Henderson in a grappling match very easily. Um, so that's a very good thing. Then he went into his powerlifting mode, which was leading up to, um, uh, the, uh, OSP fight. We see him very big, but not, the output really wasn't there. He was a little flat, but big and strong after powerlifting and, you know, taking the appropriate stuff from GNC that you can find, of course. I mean, of course. It's just, you know, of course the stuff one would get from someplace like GNC does amazing 20 pounds of muscle. It's it's amazing the stuff they get on nowadays. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, it was a very, 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 very close fight. Gustin was winning the fourth round in, uh, really, until Jones hit him with his second spinning elbow attempt, and then it he blasted and put him in the plum, knee, knee, left elbow, left elbow, and, you know, rocked his world, finished the round strong. So, overall, really, uh, and then I think Gus kind of gave away the fifth round. So, really, it was really super close. If you look at the boxing damage uh, to the face, uh, Alexander had it. I think he will still have it, though, as I was saying, after Jones's powerlifting phase, he says, and there's videos in the last year, he's been boxing in his garage. So look for him to have better hands and hopefully better defense in this fight. Now let's talk about what has happened 
since they last fought each other. John Jones has fought and beat DC twice. Of course, uh, the last one where he left high kicked him in an orbit um, got turned into a no contest. Surprise, surprise. Are we seeing a theme here? Uh, he um, decisioned OSP. Didn't look that great in the fight, but obviously, you know, if you can still dictate a fight and easily win a decision against a tough athletic football player like OSP and catch wrestler in OSP, um, pretty good stuff. And he also decisioned Glover, who really, that's when he was retching the arm, standing with a standing elbow crank I like. And a lot of stuff I praised John Jones for. Look at my five or seven techniques, I think video and how to defend them, John Jones video I put together. If you're really interested in John Jones' technique, I made like a 25 or 30 minute video on it with his techniques and then how to counter his techniques that have wrecked so many opponents. Uh, guys, going back to uh, the the estrogen blockers and steroids, you might I've been around the game a very long time in a lot of camps. You might want to check out my video, UFC dropping the boom on estrogen blockers and steroids, John Jones and Brock Lesnar. So UFC dropping the boom, estrogen blockers and steroids, John Jones. Uh, look at that video on my YouTube page, catchyoutube.com, if you really want to learn quite a bit about this stuff. Um, in, since their last fight, what Alexander's done in that time was he KO'd Glover and a uh, fellow felon, uh, Jimmy Manoa. So that was the, the, the felon, felony fights, uh, that matchup. And uh, he KO'd Glover and uh, Manoa. He decisioned Jan Blackowitz, and he was taking him down a lot in that fight, uh, I believe. He got a decision loss to DC, split decision loss to DC, I believe. And he, t he got TKO'd himself by Rumble. So... He lost twice. He won one, lost twice, and then won his recent two. Uh, the KO Glover by spamming, uh, spamming uppercuts. And then the step off uh, overhand right long hook. And um, decision Jan Blackwoods. So in that time, we've seen Glover lose, but we've also seen him get better with his wrestling, more confident with his wrestling, which in my opinion could be very big in this fight. It should be. I mean, his game plan should it be not just to rehash the first fight, but he should do a very, very strong, like actually committed takedown attempts with the last minute, minute and a half of each round. If he can get Jones down a couple times, that breaks Jones' confidence. Because you saw Jones immediately scrambling up, not after, just after the first takedown, but but when kicks were caught and stuff in the first fight. He, Jones wants to look more than human, like the t-shirt he wore out. Joan wants to be seen as a Superman. Jones needs his ego appeased. So not only are you potentially winning the fight in the, the, the judge's eyes, if the rounds are really close like they were in the first fight, uh, but if you can get takedowns even with 10 seconds of control and a nice scramble, whatever, uh, it um, gets in Jones' head. So not only needs to do that once, he should really do that every round a committed takedown attempt. Now hopefully he's trained some good split, you know, uh, entries to that overhand right to the double or single. Switch punch, lead jab, switch punch I call it, or lead superman, whatever. He could go that right into a single leg, you see me, or a double. I use that at the end of rounds a lot in my sparring, you'll see in my videos very successfully. So you should use, look at punch entries into the takedown, not just shooting from outside. Um, I still think Gus will be the better boxer, but it may be more even. It's not like Jones didn't crack him with a good right hand, some some other good punches in the first fight. Uh, I think Jones will always be kind of the better kicker. Um, he's got longer reach, both arms and legs. Uh, he, you know, had more kind of savat-style training, actually. And um, overall, my betting money... Uh, without knowing personally what he's going through, if he's actually trained, if he's not... Uh, having a very white Christmas, hopefully it was not having a very white Christmas, uh, you never can really, uh, hopefully uh, Jones performs really well. Not only that, but um, a couple months ago I um, messaged Melky on Facebook and suggested, you know, if you don't want to see this as a 60-40 fight taking a lot of damage, if you want to see it more like 85-15, Jones should memorize and practice in order combinations, so combinations of combinations. I have a very advanced system that is more advanced than just that, but combinations of combinations. So you're constantly firing on the offensive. 
there, there's more intricacies on how to really make it work, um, which I've never really revealed. But anyway, I did tweet that to, uh, or message that to Malky. Malky might have gotten thrown into his ear like, yeah, why don't you practice like memorize of some of your favorite combos and put them together? So if you see a higher output of getting off first constantly instead of waiting and seeing, which everyone does in, in fighting, all fighting, boxing, taekwondo, whatever, most guys spend the, the oh, what's he going to do? What's he going to do? Okay, oh, oh, okay, I'll go. So literally, if you watch most fights, you only fight a minute and a half out of a five-minute round because the rest of the time is staring at each other and waiting for the other guy to go first. So he who gets off first, he with the mostest does the bestest, um, especially if you know how to mix up, like John Jones does. I don't want to give too much away. So we might we might see that, so we might see that, which could also get stuffled if Gustafson is trained to do takedowns a lot in the last round. Betting money for me is on John Jones, especially if you look at he's won every fight, even if one was turned into a no contest. If you look at DC versus Glover, um, but then also Gustafson ha has finished Glover, but he didn't finish the same Glover. He he finished uh, Usada Glover who didn't look as thick in the neck and the shoulders, um, you know, looked a lot leaner, not quite as big and strong as he used to. Um, maybe GNC went out of business, I don't know. Um, let's see, uh, besides that, John Jones, I know you probably hate me now, and Malky, please, you know, like I just, I, I'm looking at facts, I'm sorry, other people can't put together facts, I can't speak the truth, they're too scared to get in their press passes removed. Um, I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you something here. Alexander is really falling in love with spamming that triple rear uppercut. He thinks he's John Jones with the triple lead uppercut or that Muay Thai fighter with the tri triple lead uppercut knockout in one recently. He likes to spam. He does hurt guys with his rear uppercut, with his six. He spammed it in two different fights, meaning it's a habit. He spammed it against um, Felon uh, Manua, Banger Manua. He spammed it against him. And then the third one got kind of blocked and he switched it to a hook. But he spammed three uppercuts and he also spammed three uppercuts against Glover, changed the angle, and then hit him with that kind of overhand right long hook for the knockout. So I would be doing pad drills, hitting Jones with that rear uppercut, and then hold, holding and making Jones step off the center line, not being there for the second one, stepping off the center line like you're supposed to on your overhand right. So anytime you, you feel this, which is either going to be an uppercut, a knee, if your structure is broken, but if you're standing straight up, it's an uppercut or a front kick, right? So anytime you're getting hit here, it's probably going to be from the uppercut. It should be training reaction, boom, boom, stepping off the center line with an overhand right. You still got a couple days, Jones Camp. If you see this, you might want to train that a little bit. So, boom, boom on the pad holder. So, or hit and then hold. So, um, guys, my, my my money's on Jones. Still think even though Jones' boxing should have improved, there's always a chance Alexander could knock him out with his hands. I mean, there's always that possibility when he's switching stances or something. If he doesn't does it wrong. Uh, there's always a possibility of that, but my money, uh, based on the past five performances, uh, would would be uh, Jones winning yet again. Okay, uh, I think I pretty much covered that. Nice choice in the FN, John. You know, I, I have an FN. I love it. Um, hope he doesn't go crazy someday. Like, I mean, you know, like not keeping things contained so he can still compete in the MMA world. Um, let's see, let's go on to the co-main event, also a title fight, and huge in my opinion, I'm really excited about this fight, you should be too, because it's the unstoppable, it seems, Chris Cyborg versus a fellow champion, Brazilian champion, Amanda Nunes, this is champion versus champion, this is a true super fight, and it's not really getting hype the way that it should be, this is a true super fight, a current 145 pound champion versus the current 135 pound champion, both knockout artists, both with a lot of first round uh, KOs, this is closer than I think people are giving it, you know, the, the, why is the UFC machine never gotten behind Amanda Nunes. I will never understand that. I will never understand that. You talk, you hear Joe Rogan talking about they didn't even know her name when she fought Ronda, calling her cannon fodder. Didn't he, the execs running the UFC nowadays don't even know Amanda Nunes, don't even promote her? What the F, dude? 
this girl not only knocks out Misha Tate or chokes her out in the first round, and then knocks out Ronda Rousey in the first round. She submits, submits McMahon, right? I think she submitted McMahon. Let me check on that. Uh, I mean, it's crazy that you're not promoting. This, this fight is closer than people think. It may not play out that way. But I think Amanda has a very good chance of beating Cyborg, even with a huge size disparity. So, let's see. Let's talk about their last um, seven fights. Okay. Um, Cyborg last seven fights, they were almost always usually both underskilled and undersized, under muscular size anyway. I mean, they weren't looking like true athletes or they were really undersized. So in her last seven fights, they almost always were both extremely underskilled and undersized. Keep that in mind. Except for Holly Holm, whom she beat in a five-round decision. She didn't finish Holly Holm. She beat her in a five-round decision. Um, she did beat the large and tough uh, Avenger, who's pretty good on the ground, uh, but not the best standing up. Um, she made it in the third round because of her size. But, you know, again, she's not fighting same size and skill level. She's not fighting world championship level, skill level. For that, you'd have to go, uh, other than Holly Holm, you'd have to go back to um, years ago. You'd have to go back to mid-2013 to the skilled Marlos Kunin, who she stopped in the fourth round. But that was a long time ago, mid-2013. I mean, Leslie Smith is tough as hell, but Leslie Smith was fighting comfortably at 125, I believe. So the much smaller Leslie Smith versus the walking weight 172-173 in shape ripped Chris Cyborg. So walking weight, what I would want for both athletes, say five weeks out from the fight, you want to PK days out from the fight, so he gets four weeks of still hard training, I would want them to be Cyborg 172-173 and then start losing weight. Uh, about five weeks out, so that's what I really consider the walking around yet in shape weight. And Amanda, I would have wanted up to about 158. Now, she might not have. I don't know any reports. She might only be 150. I hope not. I hope that five weeks out she was 158. And then still 158 to about 172. That's a big difference when you're talking muscular size and the shoulders for hitting power and whatnot. I give that. Um, so in the last seven fights for Amanda Nunes, um, let's see my notes here. She um, she finished Ronda Misha McMahon, the Olympic uh, gold medalist, and Shayna Baszler in the first round. In the first round, she finished Ronda Misha, always top contender, McMahon, gold medalist, and Baszler for what it's worth in the first round. She decisioned the now 125-pound champion, Shevchenko, two times. And in her last fight, she TKO'd Raquel Pennington in a five-round absolute beatdown. Okay? So, um, not only has she had the first-round finishes, but she's had um, uh, two five-round fights, I guess. Shevchenko won was three. The last one was five rounds, I believe. And the Pennington fight went into the fifth round. So that's good on... on um, that's good on her side, on Nunez's side, is that she's gone the distance and been finishing. So going the distance is a very good thing. Now, I want to say this about Cyborg. Cyborg has looked really amazing her last few fights. Um, the uninitiated will just see the same brawler. She's not the same brawler, and hopefully she's not the same brawler in this fight. Hopefully she doesn't get sucked into that. Um, Jason Perlow's done wonders with her. She now has the distance control to cutting off the ring or cage. She knows how to cut off and she knows how to keep distance. She used to just rush in and, and shortchange her own right hands and stuff. Now she was spamming girls way under skill that couldn't take her power up against the cages and stuff. But she was she was crowding her own distance. She does not do that anymore. Cyborg is now really an amazing boxer. Really, really. Just like Nunes is an amazing boxer in MMA anyway. A uh, hand fighter for MMA anyway. Except for one thing. Cyborg still draws back her right hand even on the pads before hitting it. Perlo obviously hasn't managed to get that out of her. Even on the pads, bump, bump, bump. It's still bump, bump, bump on her combinations instead of bump, 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 bump. It's not right from the guard. Bump, 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 bump. It's bump.